Hey, cheers, Tom. And yeah, I'd just like to reiterate that. Thanks to everyone else for coming out. It's uh, it's really good to see some familiar faces there, always some familiar names in the uh, in the sidebar there, and some veterans of the uh, the heady Connex days, which is which is always fantastic to see. Of course, you remember the original Connex seminar program. A lot of you uh, was was quite a successful endeavor, and we're we'll starting that again with HPC Connex. And today, it's a, it's an absolute pleasure to welcome Professor Chris Picard to give us the first of our seminars. Now, Chris is a professor from the University of Cambridge, which um, I understand is the same place that he did his undergraduate degree and his PhD, although he's traveled around quite a bit in the meantime, um, working the foreign climbs of Thailand, uh, Taiwan, in fact, Germany, France, and even Scotland. So quite quite exciting little, uh, little career there. Um, he settled down at University College London um, a little bit later on. Uh, but he's now ultimately come home to the University of Cambridge, where he's been doing some, some really, really brilliant work. So I'm excited to hear about it today. Um, hopefully all of you are. Hopefully you're all seated comfortably and your seatbelts are fastened. Um, I'm personally ready to hear what Chris has got to say. So Chris, if you want to take it away, feel free to. And I'd just say, uh, house rules before we begin. Uh, if there are any questions, please do just drop them down in the chat um, anytime throughout the talk. We'll come to them at the end, of course, but do drop them anytime. And uh, obviously, you know, you're here to, to hear from Chris, so floor's yours, Chris. Cheers. That's fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Connor, for the very kind uh, introduction and for Connex, for uh, HPC Connex, for inviting me to, to start off this um, online series. So I had to, I thought a little bit about why I might have been invited to give this, um, uh, to give this talk. And I guess there's, there's several reasons, several ways that, that my research and interest has overlapped with, with what you're uh, doing in your uh, HPC uh, network. One of them is that I'm a member and have been for a very long time of the UKCP HPC network. And that's another of these uh, consortia. And for well, well over 20 years now, it's been the home of the methods developers, the people who write the codes like CASTEP and, and, and OneTEP and various other um, electronic structure uh, codes. And what we tend to do is we use that uh, high performance computing time to test out novel, novel methodologies. And that's been my interest um, throughout my career to try and uh, come up with new things that we can do with uh, computers, hopefully apply it early on to a few interesting examples. But really, I've never considered my, my, my job to be finished until others have taken those, those methods and codes on and have integrated them in their research. And as I'll explain in a few seconds, I actually started off with core level spectroscopy. That was my first um, uh, topic of interest, not, not X-ray, but electron uh, spectroscopy. But I then moved on to nuclear magnetic resonance. NMR. And there's a collaborative computational project in NMR crystallography, which is very much based around those um, uh, methods I developed um, then. But since about the mid-2000s, I've come to the topic of structure prediction, first principle structure prediction. I'm fundamentally interested in, in uh, you know, figuring out how atoms are arranged in, in, in materials. And I started with a very close connection with experiment. But as I mentioned later on, you quickly realize that if you're going to be computing the spectra or um, diffraction patterns of a material, you have to have a model of the material in the first place. So where do you get that from? Either you build it by hand with graphical software in some way, or someone who's already measured it, which is a little bit, or, or determined it, which is a little bit boring because we already know what it is, and we're just testing our spectroscopy in that, in that area. But if we want to veer into the unknown, then we need models for structure. And so that's what I'm mostly going to be talking about um, today. And OK, good. I, I hopefully, have I changed the slide to the first slide? Yep, that's looking good. Thing. Okay, very good. Yes, so, so this is very much back to my very first effort in research when I was a PhD student, actually. And what I'm showing here is a, a, a report that we published in the, in the conference series of Institute of Physics, which is the EMAG conference, which was the Ele electron microscopy uh, uh, conference. It was kind of the outcome of my first um, year of research. And my, what my mission had been, by my, given to me by my supervisor, Mike Payne, the, the first developer of the CASTEP code, was to use this newfangled density plane wave density functional theory me method to calculate electron energy loss spectra. He'd been chatting to other people in the, um, in the Cavendish laboratory. There's Mick Brown, who was a, a famous um, uh, electron spec spectroscopist then in the Cavendish, um, who were doing scanning um, transmission electron microscopy. And the EEL spectrometers, the electron energy loss spectrometers were starting to come online and they were starting to um, uh, to measure interesting things, and so the thought was, well, could we compute and, and predict what what um, what they were what what they were measuring in the in, in the labs? 
And so this was, yeah, this was this was my was my 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 first year of work. And what what we focused on, what I focused on in, at that time was um, uh, uh, Brion's own integration. And my first recognition was that the methods that were being used for Brion's own integration, that's that's summing up all the electronic states in the in the first in the in the in the Brion zone, uh, were rather primitive at that at, at that time. And I thought I'd have a go with this this at that point, probably not particularly fashionable technique called machine learning and neural networks. And so actually what we did in the first year, I worked with, uh, Mick, uh, with uh, Mark Gibbs, who was a PhD student of Dave McKay in the Cavendish Laboratory. And we used neural networks and other machine le le um, learning techniques to do nonlinear interpolation of the Brion zone. Um, this was this sort of worked. So I can show an example of a density of states on the right-hand side for, um, for, 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 for graphite. And we also went as far as to calculate K edges for, for um, the near edge um, structure for carbon in, in, in graphite. And actually something I never came back to again later on was looking at non-dipole effects or, or, or momentum transfer in these, in, in these systems. Now that's something that's a bit of a less of a concern for X-ray spectroscopy, but for electron spectroscopy, the electrons are heavy and there can be larger amounts of, um, of momentum involved. Now that was the, 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 um, um, the, the first application, but what I, what I noticed today, looking back at this abstract when I was putting this slide together, that I emphasized in the abstract that the point of this was to combine this with ab initio quantum mechanical structural optimization. I think I'd already been aware that we needed to know where the atoms were in order to compute the um, compute the spectra. And just to highlight here is this: we were using these um, newfangled neural, neural networks. Now, after the first year, actually, um, I abandoned the neural networks. Actually, they weren't as good as other methods. I, I moved towards um, perturbation theory at that time. It was much more computationally um, um, uh, uh, effective. But we still carry, I still carried on cal calculating near edge structure. But at that point, I was putting together the what I would say were the key things that required to compute um, efficiently compute near edge structure in, 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 in solids. And that was computing the matrix elements accurately. So in the plane wave pseudopotential method, the quality of the matrix elements that people were computing in those days were not very good. And so I hit upon the idea of using projector augmented wave methods, which led to more accurate um, matrix elements. You see on the right hand uh, right hand side, we've got a, a, the uncorrected and corrected um, spectra and compared to all electron spectra. And you can see that the, the corrected spectra were looking very similar to the all electron um, spectra. And then the other innovation was the inclusion of, of um, core hole effects through pseudopotentials into, the, into, in this case, fairly simple systems. So I was just looking at diamond. And on the right hand side, you can look at the um, a computed spectra of diamond with and without core hole effects. And in fact, those basic in in ingredients of what have gone into the sort of class step implementation of um, computing near edge structure. Um, so using a combination of class step and, and an additional code, code called Optodos. Um, Optodos is a GPL free code. Class step obviously is available, um, is, is a commercial code, but it's available for academic use globally. So there's no, no real barrier to using that if you're working in an academic environment. Um, and also, actually, if you're interested in this and seeing what we were doing in those in, 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 in those days, my thesis is apparently I discovered today still online, and you can you can you can get hold of it um, there. And so I talk in quite a lot of detail there about the, the importance of the core hole spectroscopy, uh, the, 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 the core hole effect and projector augmented waves. But anyway, for the rest of the for the rest of this talk, I'm going to focus on you know what I recognized early on, which was the importance of having a model of which you compute the spectra. And that's what I've been tangled up for for many, many years um, now. And so this I call you know, structure prediction in general. Uh, if you're interested in crystals, that might be called crystal structure prediction. Yes. But actually, and I'm sure it's the case in a lot of your projects, is it's not the perfect crystals that are necessarily the most interesting thing. It's possibly defects and grain boundaries and other things. And indeed, we can apply these ideas of structure, uh, of structure prediction to those as well. So the basic idea is, given a collection of atoms, you know, how will they arrange themselves in nature? And you, you take a few moments reflection, but this is, pro this is quite obviously a global optimization problem because energy is the key quantity. And in nature, atoms are moving around, arranging themselves to minimize with temperature free energy or to move around the energy landscape. And we can sometimes, we often ignore temperature uh, in, these, in these simulations, although towards the end, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about efforts to bring temperature, um, temperature back in. So that's the, the, the mission we, we, we set ourselves. And the, and the method I developed for that is, is, I mean, so simple, I think, I hope that all of you on the call would think of it as well as the way to compute, uh, as to predict um, uh, crystal structures, although you may not be sure if it was gonna work or not. And so the approach we took 
was to um, fill crystalline unit cells with atoms randomly. And initially the code was a simple bash script that pasted in random fractional coordinates for carbon atoms into a, into a unit cell and then feed that randomly generated um, input unit cell into a code like CASTEP and do quantum mechanical structural optimization. Now, if you do it just once, the odds are you probably won't find the ground state structure. You'll probably get stuck in some highly ener energetic or even, even just slightly energetic metastable phase. Now, the real breakthrough was not you know, making a random unit cell and breaking it once. It was doing it at the right time. And the right time was when multi-core parallel computers came online. And so this was in the sort of mid 2000s and where before we had a single computer chip, we were getting to the point where we could have multiple cores on that single computer chip. So you could be sitting at home with effectively, from my perspective then as someone who had struggled to get access to high performance computing, effectively we could start to get supercomputers at home. And now you have supercomputers in your pockets in your, in your, with your mobile phones where you have multi-core, um, I don't know how many cores, if you include um, GPU cores as well, people that this audience is carry, carrying in their pockets right, right now. But at the time, this was a, was, a, was, was, was a revelation and it meant we could do the calculations multiple times in parallel. If you could do that, if you could randomly sample the configurations and, and geometry optimize them and locate multiple local minima, if you do it enough times, then you start to saturate the, the, um, the energy landscape and pick out the large basins in that energy landscape. And hopefully, if you do it, if you do it a, a, a enough times, then you will you know, map out not just the ground state, but all the likely metastable states as well. Now, of course, there's the question of what's enough times, and I'll come back to that in a, um, in a, in a little while. But I'd like to just show you uh, an example here. And so here's an example. The code that I'm talk, talk mentioning now, the AIRS code, the Ab initio random structure searching code, it's available under GPL2, and you can download that code. And there are a bunch of examples um, included in that, in that um, distribution. And so the 2.3 example is this one here, where um, a known unit cell had been determined for a high pressure phase of boron. So the crystal structure, the, the, the diffraction pattern had been indexed but the arrangement of the atoms inside the unit cell was not known. And this was first done by Artem Oganov, who is also working in crystal structure um, uh, prediction. Um, so we don't know where the boron atoms are, but we know the shape of the box. So if we multiple times randomly put your, your atoms in a box and do a local geometry optimization using CASTEP, most often you'll end up in this peak of structural density of states that you see on the right-hand side. So zero is the ground state structure, and about 0.4 EV above the ground state is where most of your structures end up. Okay. The key thing is they don't all end up in these high energy states. Sometimes about one in 200 times they end up in this low energy state. So this is what it looks like if you do a geometry optimization from this random structure, and we're going to end up where this gray spot is about 0.4 EV above the ground state. So as we do that, it starts off looking random and it ends up looking random. Okay, but this is a, a lower energy local minima that still looks somewhat amorphous. So maybe this is like an amorphous phase of the boron um, of the boron structure. Structure. But if we do this again, well, we say we do it two, over two hundred times. Then about one in two hundred times, we get this situation where an initial structure is rather it starts off looking rather random. But we do the geometry optimization, and if we wait long enough, then eventually it clicks into this perfect crystal uh, crystal structure. It's a beautiful structure. Uh, it's <laughs> Oh, hello. I heard a, a noise. OK, so this beautiful structure made up of icosahedra and, um, and pairs of boron atoms. And in fact, Artem Oganov pointed out that there's charge transfer between these icosahedra and these dimers. And so this comes a slightly ionic um, covalent system. OK, so what's, you know, what are the features of random structure searching? Now, there are other global optimization strategies out there, such as evolutionary algorithms particle swarm algorithms. Um, global optimization methods exist on a spectrum. At one end of the spectrum, you have what are called high exploration approaches. So they, they pay a lot of effort event about venturing into new regions of configuration space. And on the other side, you've got learning star style algorithms, which learn from calculations that have happened before. And they are called exploitation-based algorithms. And the random structure searching is far on the side of exploration. So I don't make large claims about um, about the, it being necessarily the fastest method. But as a physicist, I'm really interested in finding new things, not necessarily finding the structure of diamond really quickly, because we know the structure of diamond, but to have a, a technique which is 
reliable and robust enough that will, from time to time, throw up completely new discoveries. And I'll show some examples of that late, late, later on. The other very powerful feature of these random structure searching uh, uh, approaches is that it's intrinsically parallel. It's what we call trivially parallel. So each individual structural optimization is ind independent of any other. And this has really come into its own with the growth of HPC computing and possibly the distributed nature of that computing. So in principle, these algorithms, these, these random sampling algorithms, I've never done this myself because I haven't got a big enough computer, but potentially you could run it on millions of cores at once. I routinely run it on thousands of cores, but potentially you could run it on, 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 on millions of cores. Now, so you're doing essentially a, a, a sort of a, 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 a sampling approach from a statistical physics point, point of view. And each of these samples that you're, you're making of the, um, of, the lands, of the landscape, because there's no exploitation or learning, are uncorrelated. And this is really nice because it gives you uh, a, an understanding of how well your search is going. And I, I, I mentioned it here, it's like a, a non-stopping condition. So this is one of the challenges of stochastic algorithm. When do I stop searching? Well, I, can, I can't really tell you when to stop searching because you don't know. There could always be something else that you might find because you're doing a stochastic um, way of sampling this landscape. But what this does tell you is when not to stop. And you mustn't stop your search if your favorite structure you found, your lowest energy structure that looks just beautiful, has only been found once. OK, because there's a fairly large chance that if you kept it running over the weekend, you'd come back and there'd be something even lower in energy that comes, that, that, that comes out. And this leads to a robustness of these predictions. You know, if you don't um, um, stop until you found the ground state structures or, 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 or several of the lowest energy structures multiple times, then you have a reasonable confidence that you've started to saturate that space. And even if there's this really rare structure that you haven't found yet because the size of the basin is so small in this landscape, that also might be quite hard for nature to find as well. So what actually you end up doing is somehow being biased towards the easier things to find, which might be the easiest, easier ones to, to, to synthesize in reality. And the other thing that I, the, the, the advantage I, or, or nice thing I think about this method, and I hope you agree, you know, as I'm explaining this to you, is its robustness just because it's based on, um, on, 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 on sampling. It's got no you know, sort of meta learning parameters. It just goes trying again and again and again, randomly generated structures, but it's also communicable in the sense that I can um, explain or you can explain to someone when you've done a, done a search, you can write your little paragraph in your, in your paper and explain what's happened in your search because you've got a, a bunch of initial parameters that tell you how you've built your random structure. And you can say how many samples you've, you, you've done. The parameters involved in, in, in building up those, that, that, um, those, those structures are in terms of lattice parameters, bond distances, molecular units. They're all in chemical language. So if you're a structural or materials chemist, it speaks the language of random structures, um, random structure searching. And so it, it fits quite well. That's a little less the case with evolutionary algorithms where you're talking about hereditary and mutation and things, which aren't really natural topics for, uh, for materials. OK, so I, I mentioned a little bit. There are, there, are, there are ways in which you build your, 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 your structures. And we call it you know, making random sensible structures. And I mean, when you build a random unit cell, don't set the lattice parameters to kilometers in length. And we know roughly what the density of the material is. So you choose the, the, lattice parameter, the lattice parameters to give you roughly the right density. OK, that's already steering. Now, in principle, truly randomly, you could pick kilometer long or light year um, long lattice parameters. But by being sensible, we focus on the region of configuration space that is likely to give good results. Um, on top of that, we try not to put the atoms um, right next to each other or right on top of each other. Because we know in chemistry, atoms don't sit on top of each other. They, they're gonna be repulsed and sit a certain distance apart from each other. And indeed, pragmatically, if you do a, um, a DFT calculation, if you put atoms on top of them, each other in a DFT calculation, often it will crash or complain in some way. So it's pragmatically not a good idea to put the atoms too close to each other. Now that's, that's sort of physics. But beyond, beyond that, you can also make the structures sensible from a chemical point of view. So the atoms and molecules are combined in fragments or, mole or, or, or uh, into molecules. And also the distances between the atoms have chemically sensible distances as well. So you can use this as a pre-filter for your random structures to just sample the ones that are likely to be low energy. Now, this is reducing the, this is, this is biasing the sample in some sense, or you can think of it as restricting it to a region in configuration, um, in configuration space, 
And if, you're, if the solution that you're interested in lies somewhere else outside of these constraints that you had applied, you'll miss it, okay? But that's the art. That's how, as a scientist, you have a conversation with this code and you try different things. And if you, um, if you put constraints that are inappropriate, you potentially can get, get um, um, stuck in regions of space that are not, not useful. Another very powerful idea practically is the use of symmetry. So in many cases for crystal structures, the ground state structures have some symmetry. And this can shrink the, the, the size of the space that you have to have to search. And you can do this in 3D or in surfaces and slabs or, or for molecules or, 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 or clusters. And the other powerful um, constraint, and, and, and this is really um, uh, um, probably appropriate for this group, is the combining of experimental data like we did for the boron example with the searches. Because this, again, can massively reduce the, the size of the space you have to search for your solution down to. If you know what the lattice parameters are, or um, you have some other constraint on your, on, your, on, on, on your system, that can speed things up considerably. Now, this is going to be relevant for, um, uh, for, for, for um, later on. You know, I've emphasized that I was using you know, plane wave density functional theory for doing these, these searches. But traditionally, actually, the field of, of, of crystal structure prediction relied on fast empirical potentials because they were felt that that's the only way to get the, the correct sampling of, of, um, of, of structure space. But here I'm just showing an, an example of why actually these, why crystal structure prediction probably was thought as difficult for people using empirical potentials. And that's because the old style of empirical potentials, for example, here we have a Tursoff potential for silicon versus density functional theory. Um, what I'm showing are the density of structure states. So the, the energies of the randomly sampled structures when relaxed using a Tursoff potential and density functional theory. And you can see the distribution energies are just different. That tells you that the energy landscapes are just different. So apart away from the ground state, the rest of the energy landscape doesn't look like the true ground state, which is probably closer to the DFT uh, result. And indeed, if you did a random sampling of the Tursoff potential here, you can see that for this gray line, there's very little weight down at zero for the known diamond structure of, of, of silicon. So you probably random searching probably wouldn't work for the Tursoff potential. It has too many false minima at high energy that your samples would get trapped in. But in density functional theory, things are smoother, more quantum mechanical, and you slip down the energy landscape. And most of the structures you end up with, although they may be amorphous, are um, sensible in some sense chemically. Now, I'm going to completely go against this later on in the talk, where I emphasize um, the new developments in machine learning. So I said right at the very beginning that my first paper, I, I, I tried machine learning, didn't think it was any good, and abandoned it for about 10, 10 years. But actually, I've got my, my mind has been dramatically changed by my work with Gabor Chani in Cambridge and, 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 and Volker Derringer, where we returned to this problem of developing empirical potentials, but did it in a way that was appropriate for random structure searching. And this mean, meant making sure your, your machine learning potential for your, your system could describe the entire energy landscape, including the crazy structures that you start off with in a random search. And I'm going to come back to um, um, that later on, but we first did this together um, in 2018 for boron itself. So just very quickly, I'm not going to go in, it's not, this isn't a high pressure community, but a lot of the applica early applications of, 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 of crystal structure prediction had been to uh, matter at, uh, at extremes, and in particular extreme pressure. And the reason for that was the experiments are incredibly difficult to do at these high, high pressures. So there was a lot of scope for structure prediction, both by myself, Artem Elgonov, or Yang Ming Ma in, 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 in China, all sort of had a lot of fun in the early days of using structure prediction to, to, to come up with nice predictions about what would happen when you, when you squeeze matter to obscenely high pressures from you know, pressures 10 GPA or so that you might have, uh, encounter on a, a moon of, 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 of Saturn or Jupiter to the hundreds of gigapascals in the Earth to the tens of terapascals or petapascals in Jupiter or stellar objects, all the way up to sort of big bang pressure. Well, we have certainly haven't done any simulations up to this up to this level here, but but um, this was really just to emphasize that the pressure scale goes up to extremely high um, uh, levels, and we're really only dipping our toes into it so far with the experimental uh, tools that we have, which go up to atomic e explosions. So they actually have done done equation of states measurements in the in the 70s and 80s using um, um, nuclear explosions for the driving force. So here's sort of examples of, of early applications. Um, the first was the first when we published the methodology of random structure searching was initially to looking for hydride based superconductors. So it had been proposed by Neil Ashcroft that if you combined uh, hydrogen with some other element, you might be able to trick hydrogen into becoming metallic. 
at lower pressures, and that might lead to a high temperature superconductor. There's a whole story behind that, which I'll dip into a little bit later on. But there are other works such as terming good low energy candidates for pure hydrogen at high pressure. Um, we found that when we squeezed ammonia um, above about 50 gigapascals, it spontaneously ionized and become ammonium, became ammonium amide. And then at even higher pressures, at terapascal pressures, we made a prediction that, that aluminium would become a complex host guest phase, which is very interesting to the people doing um, uh, very high pressure um, uh, dynamics uh, experiments, for example, at the National Ignition Facility in the, in, in the US, where it had been thought that maybe when you kept squeezing matter, it just got simple and close packed. Where there's lots of emerging uh, information from these calculations that actually know we are active by, as you bring in the different core levels of, of, um, of, your, of, your, of your atoms, you get actually quite complex structure uh, emerging. So these are, but you'll notice that these structures are all quite um, simple relatively. And the early publications were focused on a particular stoichiometry, a particular composition. And now I'm going to draw a contrast to what we're doing now. So that was what we were doing in around the 2010s. And now I'll tell you the kind of things that we're doing now. And we've carried on looking for superconductors. And we're in a very nice situation where um, not only can we predict um, structures. So this first principle structure predictions allows us to bring up candidate structures, even if they have, even if the structure type has never been seen before uh, in any experiment. So we can search combinatorially through all the possible structures uh, that, might, that, that there might be. And at the same time, using codes such as quantum espresso and density functional perturbation theory, for a given structure, we can compute the superconducting transition temperature. And then, of course, experiment can be done to, to do these measurements of these, of these structures. So this, three, this loop between these three different, different approaches has given us a computational way to do um, uh, uh, discovery of new superconductors. And this has been fruitful. So here's a, re a review article I wrote with Mikhail Eremetz, a very well-known experimentalist in this field, who actually discovered two of the structures that have been predicted by not always myself, but other people doing structure um, um, prediction of high temperature superconductors under pressure. So there's this lanthanum H10 compound and the hydrogen three um, sulfur compound, which have you know, exceeded the, the, um, the cuprate um, superconductors, albeit at very high pressures. Although we note that the record um, cuprate superconductor was only achieved at 30 gigapascals anyway. So high pressure had been exploited before um, to get these record um, superconducting temperatures. So we've been doing um, you know, work on this again, following these early successes of predictions, again, on a species on, on a stoichiometry by stoichiometry basis. In the, uh, around 2020, I worked with a couple of PhD students in, in Cambridge, Alice Shipley and Michael Hutchian. And we decided, okay, can we just like move the dial a little bit further compared to what people have been doing so far? And rather than doing a, a, a structure search and a TC calculation for a single composition, let's try all the compositions at a range of different pressures. So what we did were a bunch of uh, high throughput, high throughput calculations. So doing random structure searching is itself a high throughput calculation, okay, where we take multiple initial configurations of a particular composition and relax them and see what the most stable structure is. But then we took this up another level by having multiple compositions being done at the same time as well and feeding them onto these, onto these very large num uh, computers with very large numbers of, of, of cores. And so in doing this, we, we had a couple of constraints. We restrained ourselves to small unit cells, binary hydrides. So it's hydrogen plus one other element from across the periodic table with less than, say, nine atoms in a unit cell, or maybe, maybe a bit more than that. Maybe we allowed a few more hydrogens, but you know, of order 10 atoms in a unit cell. But we also made things easy for ourselves, but we said, and we, that because we insisted that all the structures were high symmetry. And that's because we often, the, the structures that have been found to be superconducting have, do tend to have high symmetry, and also they're much easier to calculate. So if we restrict ourselves to high symmetry, we have a chance of calculating a large numbers of structures. And so here's sort of just some plots. I'm, I'm not going to great detail here, but we were generating of order 100,000 100, different binary hydride structures at each pressure. Now that's too many structures to calculate TC for, so we used a, a mixture of um, machine learning and just fairly simple observations that if the, if, the material, if, the, if the crystal structure was an insulator, we would not calculate TC because it's going to be zero. Okay, So we can screen out a lot of the structures. If the structure is too high in energy, we won't calculate TC because you could never make it. And then on top of that, we built a simple Gaussian process-based machine learning model to look at a few of the electronic structure parameters to guess whether the structure was likely to have a high TC which allowed us to only have to do of order 20 or so TC calculations each time. 
So we filtered down from 100,000 to about 20 and then did the DFT calculation of superconducting transition temperatures. And then we ended up with this result here. Now there's a lot of data on here. On the right hand side, there's a table of the superconductors that we came up with in these calculations, including, for example, sodium H6, which had a TC of uh, up to 279 um, Kelvin, which was above, well, above melting of, of, um, of, of water, albeit 100 gigapascals, so not a, not a useful um, um, superconducting um, compound. The structures with lines underneath them are, um, are, were new to this study. So the TC hadn't been calculated for these structures before. The other ones were rediscoveries of things that people had found already through the, through the literature. But generating this large number of, of, of structures allowed us to do something rather nice, which is to plot a, um, um, a distribution of these structures with pressure. And what was very nice was that we could see, OK, so you go to very high pressure. Some of the structures have very high TC. Um, but also, as you go down to lower pressures, the TC was not dropping too dramatically with pressure, which has given hope. And, and we're not the only ones. I mean, there's quite a lot of bit of a gold rush at the moment going on to try and find lower, lower pressure, but high TC superconductors. Now, there'll be, there, there has, some of you may have heard of some reports of experimental, um, um, uh, uh, experimentally determined hydrogen-based superconductors, but I won't go into those details here. I'm happy to discuss about them in the, in, 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 in the chat, but this high throughput search has certainly added, added fuel to the, the, the hunt for um, both high TC and low pressure superconductivity. So the key difference there from, you know, say, 15 years ago was rather than searching for one composition, we're sort of searching for multiple compositions. But there's still an issue. That search was done using density functional theory, and it is slow, and it does take a lot of computing resources. So the last thing I'm going to talk about is, is um, what we've been doing in my group to um, accelerate this search using a style of machine learning potential, which has carefully de been carefully designed to be what we need for structure search, i.e., we need it to be fast to generate, and we need it to be uh, robust, so it's not allowed to have false minima, which means it probably has to be quite simple, not too many parameters, so we don't get overfitted. And I'll, I'll come back to that a little bit later on. And so the, the basic idea behind our approach was this, this concept of a simple three-body uh, potential based on the ideas of Leonard Jones. Now, Leonard Jones gives us a really nice um, model for binary compounds or, 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 or compounds that interact between um, two different species. So we've got the, the classic 12-6 form of the potential there. And now if you allow this number, this B, to be both positive and negative, it can actually describe you know, attraction and repulsion between species as well. And so I had a previous study with a PhD student in UCL where we showed that just using binary Leonard Jones models, we could actually, um, although we don't get the energetics perfectly, we could describe the structures of a very wide range of, um, of, um, of inorganic crystal structures. But this simple binary potential or, or two-body potential is no good for, say, elements such as carbon or anything where you've got some, some um, covalent bonding because it won't get you your bond, ang your bond angles. All, those, all the structures of, of Leonard Jones are essentially close packed in some, uh, in, in, in some way for, the, for, the, um, for elemental systems. And so I was just, I explored what, I kind of tried to channel Leonard Jones, you know, who wrote this beautifully simple potential you know, what would he have written down if he was going to try and write down a three-body potential? And I wrote down this functional form you can see here. We just add an extra term, which um, looks, sits on a, an atom, looks at the neighbors of the atoms, and looks at the interaction between the neighbors of the atoms, and is given in this simple functional form here. And I found I could make, put, take this potential and then do a structure search using potentials where I was by hand choosing the parameters and look at what kinds of structures were coming out. And I found that as I adjusted, uh, adjusted these parameters, the C's and the N's and the M's, I was able sometimes to find, say, the diamond structure. I could get nice open structures, or I could get um, graphite. Or what really convinced me that it was onto something was when I noticed I could find the, the, the uh, alpha boron structure, which is made up of icosahedra of borons. And this is, in principle, quite a complex crystal structure derived from complex um, chemical interactions, but appears to be captured in this simple model. So what I've done, and I'm not going to go into great detail here, but I've used this as a, as a basis for developing descriptors for a new style of um, neural network potential. And I call these potentials ephemeral potentials. And the reason I call them ephemeral potentials is I want to 
inspire people not to spend their whole lives making a database of potentials and to use those for the rest of their research. But I would like people to be able to make the potentials as they go along. So they have a new problem, a new search that they want to do. They want to do a search in a restricted region of, of, of configuration space. Well, design a potential that's good for that. Okay, and you can design it as part of the search procedure by doing a, uh, an active learning scheme where we start by making a potential based on completely random structures, not relaxed at all, but the DFT calculated random structures. We make a first generation of potential and then we use that potential. We do an air search with that potential and then the structures that result from the, that, that, that search with the first generation of potential, we shake them a little bit. We move the atoms around a little bit, recompute the DFT energies and then add that to the database of our, uh, for our potential and then retrain a new potential, go around in a loop typically five times and then end up with a potential that is converged in some, in, in, in some way. And there are some details here of how we've done this. You know, those that are interested could read those words. They won't necessarily mean, make, mean um, um, something to everybody, but I've, I've, yeah, there's, we've made lots of sort of small choices to make the potential robust and smooth. And in the bottom right hand corner here, you can see a potential that I've trained actually for quite a complex system. This is an iron, lithium iron oxalate compound. And the nature of the searching of this iterative searching al al algorithm is that it doesn't focus too much on the high energy regions of the landscape. It doesn't matter really what the energy is up there. We just want it to be high. Okay, but it puts a lot of its effort on the low energy structures, which we need for ranking the polymorphs or structures at, at, at the end. So now we're using this routinely in our um, in our searching and in the in the first paper I published on this in PRB in 2022, I insisted on showing uh, an application of this um, to do something that I couldn't do before. I always think when I'm developing a new method, it's important to show you not just benchmarking against things people can do already. If you've got a good method that is going to sort of, you know, um, lead to new things, show that you can do something new. And so I went back to my first Silane example and redid the search, but using the, the, the procedures using these um, uh, machine learning potentials. And I was able to handle much larger systems and much larger numbers of, 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 um, of configurations that I was able to find a much more complicated structure that both myself and others that came afterwards had missed completely. And that's this structure here on the right hand side. It's on the left hand side, it has 60 atoms in a primitive unit cell. And at high pressure, it's this red curve on the center enthalpy plot. It's the most stable structure above like 275 gigapascals. And you know, there'd been a paper in, I think, Nature Communications or, or, or one of those journals, um, probably about three or four years ago, where you know, the story was they found this structure was just slightly more stable than one of my, my structures. And this one just blew it out of the water by doing um, more, more, more um, considering more atoms. Part of my emphasis here is that you know, we've been done, there's been a lot of work in, in, in binary hydrides for looking for superconductors. Probably we're missing things by not having considered more, more complex structures. And so I think there's scope for going back over these systems and doing, um, doing more calculations. So now um, I want to show you why it was, what's a nice feature of these, these EDDP papers potentials compared to others that are available in the literature. And here's an example. Um, it was a preprint that was, um, that was uh, published by Ralph Droughts where he's working on these ACE potential, potentials, atomic cluster potentials, and he's justifying, well, why is his potential good? This was just last year. And his potential is good because it's smooth for a range of different carbon polymorphs. And this is in contrast to well-known potentials such as turbo gap and gap and this neural network potential here. So what's, hap what this, what's happened in these plots is you've taken a bunch of different structures, say graphite, diamond, simple cubic, BCC, and you've just swept through the lattice parameters Okay, and you've monitored how the energy is varying as you're sweeping through those lattice parameters. And physically, that should be a smooth curve. But what you're seeing for these um, machine learning potentials is that they work quite well near the minimum, near the global minima for diamond and, and carbon and, and uh, diamond and graphite and so on. But as you move away from that, and also for physical crystal structures, you have very rough energy landscapes. This would cause to me, when I'm doing structure prediction, the kind of problem I have with a Tersoff potential. So it's not acceptable, I need smooth potentials. So here's the, 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 what we get with carbon for our potentials. And this is, I've just shown, just to show some pictures of my research group, it's quite, um, they're helping me with, us, with this project now. And this was a potential that we were able to make in, a, you know, in not very much time at all, half an hour or so, maybe a bit more on a, super com on a, on a, on a, on a supercomputer. And without trying, because of this simplistic 
um, representation of the potential, it just automatically came out smooth. Not perfect. Our lines don't perfectly align on top of the DFT data. But from the point of view of searching for new structures, it's getting most things right, even for strange structures. So this is reassuring uh, until um, actually it was Si Hun Ju who did these, these sweeps for our potentials and compared it to the, um, the work of Ralph Droughts. We had a feeling that our potential was behaving well, but we hadn't really seen why, what was so, so um, good about it. So now I'm just going to show you a couple of examples in the last minute or so of what we're doing with these potentials. So this is work done by um, Pascal Salzbrenner, my PhD student, um, coming into his well, coming to the end of his third year, and his task had been to bring temperature into random structure searching. And so he's used these potentials to map out a phase diagram of lead. Now lead is quite difficult to do from first principles. It's a metal, so the Brion zone needs to be very carefully sampled. It's also very heavy, so really you should include spin orbit interactions, which makes your DFT calculations expensive. In order to map the melting line of lead, in principle, you need to calculate coexistence molecular dynamics. You need a big chunk of liquid and a big chunk of crystal, and you need to do a long molecular dynamic simulation. Um, this is just too expensive um, uh, from a pure DFT point of view. And so if you look in the literature, there are not many phase diagrams computed for elements such as lead. But what you see here are phase diagrams um, computed. I mean, essentially, these points can be generated on a laptop. And compared with experiments, so there's some experimental data here, it really maps out well that, that, that landscape. And what's really striking here is the, you know, even for just eight atoms in a unit cell, the, rate, the time ratio between using these machine learning potentials and using DFT. So we've done it in number of structures per hour per core if you're doing a structure search. And well, you don't really get any with DFT, but you get 40 or so uh, with the EDDPs. And so this has, been a, this has completely changed the research we're doing in our group now. We can start to tackle problems much more complex than we would have tackled otherwise. Now, one final example is um, one by um, Lewis Conway, a postdoc in my group, who used these EDDPs to learn a potential for a zinc cyanide moth. And so first I, was, I asked him whether he, could, use, he could, could generate a potential and do a structure search for these MOFs, metal organic framework sy systems. And he showed he was able to do that. He was able to find um, um, the MOF structures. Well, he could find the ones that were known uh, or discussed in the literature. And of course, in these searches, we get loads of other ones as well. Um, but then he went one step further in that he calculated the negative thermal expansion of these MOFs. And so what he did is for the, for the ground straight, for the, for the interesting uh, MOFs that he, that he came, up, came up with, he was able to take a, do a large unit cell molecular dynamics run, vary the temperature and just observe how the lattice parameters change. So a very easy way of doing, um, of, of evaluating the negative thermal e expansion. And there's one data, there's one experimental data point here for the diamond um, carbon. I'm not, I, I, oh, I don't think I've showed, showed the actual numerical results here, but at around 300 Kelvin, they, the, the, the negative thermal expansion for dia C, which is an interpenetrating diamond um, structure, is known experimentally. And a, a, a little bit suspiciously, the, cap, the value that he's calculated was pretty much precisely what the experimental one was. So I was suspicious of this because this seems a little bit too close. Um, and so I asked him, well, can you just for one, at one temperature for one structure, can you do the DFT calculation? And he's tried for a while, but even using the Arch machine, we actually just can't do these calculations with DFT. So this is a really, we're in a really interesting time now with this, this coming of machine learning in that um, it's definitely taking us to places we couldn't go with empirical potentials, old style empirical potentials, nor with DFT. And we have to be a little bit careful because we're now extrapolating with these, with, 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 with these methods. How can I, yeah, it, well, we checked against the experiment, which is something, but I'd really like to benchmark against a couple of cases with DFT. And it's becoming too difficult to do those benchmark calculations. So we need to do some thinking uh, about that, about building up our certainty of these, of these methods. Okay, so just to finish off, I think I'm not far off the, um, the, the, the time. So structure searching, you know, it's crucial for generating candidates for unknown structures for comparison with spectroscopic signatures. Okay, it's a source of structure. Um, these data derived potentials or machine learning potentials in general, not just mine, but the whole the community is generating um, many different versions of these. These are just completely changed the, the, the scope of the structure searches that we can um, do. And in many talks I've given over the last 15 years or so about um, structure search, there'll typically be one hand up that goes up and asks me about temperature. 
And finally, we can say, yes, we can start to take temperature into a, a account in these, in these searches. Now, um, CASTEP is this code, the main DFT code that we use, just to emphasize that if you're interested in using it, you can sign up for a license via the STFC and get an academic license for that, which is a group-wide license. So a PI applies for a license, and then everyone in their group can use it. Um, they just have to send their ORCID ID to the STFC to keep their records up to date. And the AIRS and EDDP code, it's available under GPL2, so you can just download it and use it, and you don't even have to tell me. But if you have any questions, you're, you're welcome to send them to the, to the email address there. So I think I've finished now and happy to move to the discussion stage. Okay, cheers.